Thank you very much. And thank you, Ingram, for the uh, privilege to be able to talk to you about my research uh, trajectory. So I'm going to really talk about three things. Where I came from, how did I get to where I am now, what am I doing now, and some of the lessons I've learned along the way. Uh, so I trained here that's in Africa. Very different journey to anybody that you've met, uh, but that's the hospital I trained at. Uh, I had the privilege of an extraordinarily good clinical training, but I didn't have much exposure to research. Um, and I went into medical school with a very clear goal of what I wanted to do. I was going to be a surgeon. There's nothing else I ever thought of doing in life. And I spent every single holiday in theatre assisting, and I utterly loved it. But after a few years of 36 hours on, 12 off, 36 hours on, 12 off, 36 hours on, 12 off, I thought, I just need a little break <coughs> to do something very different. And what's the most different thing I can do? Psychiatry. So I took a six-month break to do psychiatry. It's been a long six-month break. I'm still doing it. Because what I discovered in psychiatry was it's the intersection between neuroscience, psychology, internal medicine, and the human condition. It's utterly fascinating. It's endlessly fascinating. And certainly, it's right now, it's the biggest burden of disability. And there are huge opportunities in mental health because it's such a huge unmet need. I wasn't much exposed to research until I started going to conferences and I started listening to things. And I remember sitting as a young registrar, junior psychiatrist, listening to people talking about where the evidence for what we do comes from. And I was captivated. And I just thought, that's it. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I went out and I did a PhD. James, you'd be pleased to know I did my PhD in a malaria lab. And the reason why I did it in Malaria Lab, in, in Africa, that's the best resource department. And they had all the best toys. So they didn't mind me using their toys to study platelets, um, which is what I did my PhD on. But I just caught the bug. And the other thing I learned working in a malaria lab is there are people in areas that you would never think of talking to who you can learn an awful lot from. And this takes me to kind of where I am now. So what other people have kind of said is you need to have a big picture. But it can't be too big, and you can't be too fixed and focused on this, because you've got to be fleet of foot and flexible. So for me, I've always had my passion around one big question is, how do we discover better treatments for people with mental health conditions? And I've been utterly agnostic throughout my career what I'm looking at and how I go about looking at it. But kind of what I'm looking at now is how do we develop newer treatments? How do we develop safer, more tolerable treatments? And how do we individualize treatments? And we've developed a bench to bedside platform uh, where we start with stem cells and we go through validation and we've now through to clinical trial networks. So this is at scale what we're trying to do within uh, our institute. Let me just say something about my, the institute that I lead. It's the Impact Institute at Deakin University. And to my knowledge, it's really un different to any other institute because it's truly transdisciplinary. I share a lab with malaria researchers, I, uh, people doing osteoporosis, uh, people doing cardiovascular disease. And we collaborate and cooperate on projects. And there's synergies between the gaps where really interesting stuff happens. So this, the collaboration with infectious disease people gives us capacity in microbiome research, for example. And uh, I, uh, I think there's huge strengths in having a research institute that's without any discipline boundaries. Uh, and I think it makes our life very much easier. So what we have is a discovery platform where we use particularly patient-derived stem cells, uh, where we can look at drug repurposing. What um, Drugs that are out there, safe, tolerable, effective, known, do the same as known effective treatments. We then go to preclinical validation platforms, so that's animal models, and we also use epidemiology. We then have clinical trial networks, and our output is guidelines. The arrows go one way, but as previous speakers have very clearly mentioned, it's an iterative and bidirectional process. And we're fortunate to have a center of research excellence funding the discovery side, and we're funding for a national clinical trial network to do the clinical trial side. 
So what we do is we take stem cells from people, in this case, by people with bipolar disorder, we make pluripotent stem cells, we turn them into uh, mini brains in dishes, and then we look at what effects known treatments have on those networks to recapture what other drugs might do. So this allows us to go from uh, uh, cells treated with lithium, lamotrigine, look at gene expression, we come up with a gene expression signature of what known drugs do, we then do drug screens and come up with drugs that we can repurpose. And in this instance, we come up with a whole lot of drugs, and the one that tickled our fancy was an ACE inhibitor, and we've done uh, many studies where we come up and come up with that signal as a potential drug that might be useful. We then uh, go to animal models where we can, for example, find that angiotensin antagonists have anti-manic effects. We show that they have antidepressant effects, and because it's a disorder, we have highs and lows. That's kind of interesting. We then go to epidemiology, and we have collaborations uh, across the globe. The best epidemiology resources are all in Scandinavia. So we go and talk to our Scandinavian colleagues, and they say, yep. Yeah, if you're taking an ACE inhibitor, you have a dramatically re reduced risk of developing depression or bipolar disorder uh, compared to other people with hypertension taking other antihypertensives. So, wow, you know, so we now have a set of steps that takes us towards understanding what might be a candidate, and that allows us to get funding to do grants. And we now run trials. So that's kind of what I'm doing now. So. What are the lessons I've learned along the road that, uh, have, that I would try and share with you in terms of how you design, come up, and operationalize, and um, develop your own research career and help you answer research questions? So I think there's a, I would encourage people to be researchers because I think clinicians make the best researchers. Now, my non-clinician colleagues don't like me saying this, but unless you are a clinician, you don't really understand the clinical problems. And these are clinical problems that you're trying to f solve. And I think researchers make the best clinicians because a good res clinical researcher knows how to understand evidence, evaluate evidence, and implement evidence. And then the clinicians, uh, uh, in, in, if you have that dual role, I think you are in the perfect position. The other thing I really want to share to you is there's a large body of evidence about what makes a good, satisfying career in medicine. And there are many factors that people have studied. Uh, uh, and I did a bit of a review of the literature preparing for this talk um, on the factors that are going to make you a happy doctor and things that are going to make you an unhappy doctor. So, if you have more research activity, it's the strongest predictor of a satisfying career. If you are able, if you're working in an environment where you're able to deliver high quality care, that obviously makes you satisf uh, satisfied. Because I, I don't have to tell you, there are many environments where the constraints of the system means that your clinical care is not what you would want it to be. And that doesn't make you a happy doctor. Having teaching, generally makes you a happier doctor and it gives you more career satisfaction and working in an academic center is associated with greater career satisfaction. The more administrative load you have, the more unhappy you're gonna be. The more you have work-life imbalance where work intrudes into your life, that is obviously a, a, a um, huge workload, little control over your destiny. Um, and the other thing which comes up more in the American literature, electronic medical records. Uh, they are the bane of many physicians' lives and they detract from clinical satisfaction. So I ask the question, how often do you see an emeritus tradition? Now, academics are really interesting. They retire, but you can't get rid of them. You can't drag them out of their labs with, on horses. They come back and they just keep on doing their job unpaid. I have never seen an emergency physician retire, come back the next day and say, okay, I'm ready to start working as an emeritus emergency physician. I've never met one, maybe you have, but that says something. Um, now, it might be reverse causation, a good scientist would ask that question, but research is fascinating. You spend your life doing stuff that you're interested in, you're passionate about, you're following your dreams. You don't always do that as a physician. 
Uh, persistence, persistence, persistence. What the Americans call grit, and what uh, uh, the engineers call project management. So at Edison says it's it's one percent inspiration and ninety cent per perspiration, my own take is it's 1% inspiration, 99% project management. It's how you follow an idea through to conclusion. It's about being organized. And if you're not organized, you, it's good to surround yourself with obsessive organized people. Um, that really makes a difference. So it's been said earlier, it's a long game. Hell, it's a long game. Uh, and most of what you do is going to not turn out, right? Most things fail. Uh, in oncology, the success rate in new clinical entities is about 7 or 8 percent. In psychiatry, it's about the same, slightly higher in other fields. But most research ideas are not going to give you what you think they're going to give you. So you really have to be persistent. You have to stick at it. It's hard to get published. You're going to get rejected. It's hard to get funded. You're going to get rejected. You have to develop calluses on your backside um, because failure is ubiquitous in this business. The other thing I've learned, having come from surgery and loved it, uh, I actually, you know, I, I even dabbled in malaria when I was working in a malaria lab, and I kind of like that too. It doesn't matter what you do, really. It's how you do it. So you've got to do things with passion, with commitment, and hopefully you'll accrue some skills along the way. Uh, it's the attitude that you bring to what you do is much more important than what you do. Uh, and that, I think, is something I have learned over the, of the youngs. It's been said before, it's all about mentorship, but I'm just gonna reiterate that. And I'm gonna emphasize it from a different perspective because I've come from a different journey. My research journey began without mentorship. There wasn't anybody doing research in mental health when I trained, it didn't happen. So I, I really struggled because uh, I had to become an aut autodidact. And that wasn't by choice. Um, it was because that was what meant to me. But what it, what it did reinforce for me is how important it was. It's one thing to have it and recognize how important it is. It's altogether another thing not to have it to make you realize how important it is. So I don't want to re reiterate what's been said already, but get yourself good mentors and change them, right? Come and talk to people. We, you know, one of the things you'll find about academics, researchers, is that they really want to talk. They want to support. They're gonna, the doors are generally open. So you don't be scared to come upstairs and have a chat. Um, you'll find most academics uh, welcoming and keen to uh, generate. And certainly, if you look at what we do in our institute, uh, the two ma major priorities that we expressly have is mentorship and culture. We want to have an environment where we grow our own and we can take, I've got my honor students now professors, which is an awesome thing to see. Um, and the second thing is culture. Uh, we have, you want to have, create an environment where you walk into work and you have a sense that the people around you have your back. That Everybody supporting everybody else. Uh, the metaphor I have is, you know, you want to go to work where the senior people are emptying the dishwasher. You lead by example. So yeah, it's all about culture, um, and you know, we we all try to s um, select competent, nice people. But one of the lessons. How you delete, how you, if you, you know, you, there's this matrix between you're competent or you're not competent and you're good to work with or you're an asshole. Um, so one of the things I have learned as an institute director is the top right-hand quadrant is very easy. Those, that everybody wants to hire those. The incompetent nice guys generally survive and can be micromanaged to within an inch of their life. Um, the, the incompetent assholes are very easy, get rid of them. But the, the difficult one is the competent assholes. We all deal with people who are highly competent but are really difficult. And I thought that they were worth having and they're not. Uh, you don't want to work with these people. They make your life difficult and they're damaging to the other people that you work with. 
It's been said before, but it's really all about partnerships and collaborations. Uh, and I also want to say it's about transdisciplinary science. It's about convergence. Uh, if you, those of you who like reading scientific books, there's a wonderful book called The Medici Effect. Uh, so it's about the generation of new knowledge in the Italian Renaissance. It's how when artists, engineers, architects, philosophers, astronomers got together, it was this convergence of, of cross-pollination of intellectual ideas that allowed the Renaissance to flourish. Uh, don't stick in your silos. Talk to people in different areas. Talk to engineers. They think about things differently. And they'll often have ideas that you don't think about. Talk to data scientists. Uh, talk to people in business and law. Uh, you know, management consultants. They think about problems very differently. And you might not think that it's going to be useful to you, but the game that we're in is a very nonlinear game. And you get ideas and uh, guidance and inspiration from places that you don't expect it. And especially in mental health. Uh, what's inside the box, uh, we know what's inside the box. It's kind of not working that well. You have to get outside the box to really get solutions. The other lesson I've learned is that you don't have to know everything. You just need to know who does. Right? You, and I, I give you my own personal journey. For many years, my New Year's resolution has always been, this year I'm going to really get good at biostatistics. And sooner or later I learned... God put biostatisticians on this earth for a reason, and that reason is <laughs> for them to do the stats, and I don't have to do it. And I've got quite comfortable with that. So it's like conducting an orchestra, right? So developing a research team. You don't have to play the bassoon. You just need to know what kind of noises a bassoon should make, where those noises fit, and who's good at making those noises. And that's how you put teams together. You don't have to play the bassoon. One of the things I've also learned, uh, and that's largely through not having mentorship, is that for many years, my best teacher has fa is failure. You learn nothing much from success. People come up to you and say, that was fantastic. What have you learned? Bugger all, right? When you fail, you have to look at what you've done, and you say, well, that didn't work. Why didn't it work? What can I learn? What can I do differently? How can I think about this differently? My paper was rejected. Why? My grant was rejected. Why? That was a shit lecture. Why? Um, so you learn an awful lot from your mistakes. I mean, when I started in, uh, at doing research sitting in Africa, the, the only real feedback I got was sent off to journals. And reviewer three said, this is what you're doing wrong. And I learned because I didn't really have the mentorship to teach me that stuff. Um, I've long thought about America, right? America is an amazing place, but one of the things America does best is tolerate failure. You can go bankrupt and come back the next day and start again. They are much more tolerant as a culture of failure. We, are, we have this idea that somehow failure is linked to your identity. Let me go back to the figure. 8% of drugs fail. 8% 8, 8 of drugs succeed. Failure is the norm in medical research. Most things are negative. Uh, I was talking to the head of ANZEX, the uh, Australian New Zealand Infectious uh, uh, ICU. They've done huge numbers of amazing randomized control trials. They've never had a positive one. Uh, they're all negative. It tells you what not to do. But most things are going are to fail, and you have to get comfortable with that. We spoke a lot, of, there's a lot been spoken about the imposter syndrome. So my own take on the imposter syndrome is it never goes away. Just get used to it. Um, in fact, I'm going to frame it slightly differently. If you think that you know what you're doing, you probably don't understand the extent of the problems that you're trying to solve. Uh, and I'm much more scared of my colleagues who are utterly convinced they have the answer to everything because they generally don't, because most things are wrong. Most trials will fail, most studies are negative, most hypotheses get disproven. So you have to embrace insecurity, ignorance, and a sense that the problem is bigger than you because if, if the moment that you think that you 
have mastered it, you're going to run into hubris, and that's not good for science. It's not good for you either. Just because people agree with you doesn't mean you're right, and just because people disagree with you doesn't mean you're wrong. Uh, now, that's a difficult one. Uh, this is this one. I just saw this paper last week. I, I religiously read the NEJM every, every week. And this paper came out. So I remember being taught, well, you want to predict fractures, take vitamin D. Everybody knows this. There's not a person at a dinner party who doesn't know this, except every study that's sh tried to study this has shown that it doesn't work. Right? So if you want to advance science, you're starting with a position where there's an established view, and you're going to change it. H pylori, uh, you know, ulcers were due to, to, to too much curry. We knew that. Uh, until it wasn't the case. Now, you have to marry that with the, with the notion that most of your ideas are wrong, right? Most of your hypotheses are going to be wrong. But at the same time, <coughs> the truly transformative stuff that you're going to do, everyone's going to think is wrong when you start. And the other flip side of that is, if you've got an idea where everyone agrees with you, you're inside the box, you're not going to change anything. Right? So you have to embrace the idea that you may spend a fair amount of your time swimming against the tide. Uh, occasionally, you'll turn out to be right, and then this happens. Right? So there's a process of acceptance of ideas. So when you start with a new idea, it's always your peers will say, what rubbish, it's, it's garbage, nothing like that. I mean, I remember doing this when I was interested 15, 10 years ago in oxidative biology. And there was only one thing that was clear. It had nothing to do with mental health. So everybody said, it's rubbish, it can't work, has, it, it, there's no, it, it just doesn't even exist as an issue in the field. Then, yeah, you know, well, maybe, I suppose, there's almost, there's very little chance that it's going to turn out that way, but, well, give it a go. Uh, eventually, the next step is kind of, yes, but, and then the final stage is, well, we knew it all along. Um, and that's kind of where your peers are going to be. Um, so, if you're really going to do transformative research, you're going to start off with people not necessarily agreeing that what you're doing is right, but also the reality is that most of what your great ideas are probably not going to be right anyway. I'm going to have a slightly different view to many other people here on this question of being a generalist or a specialist. Yes, you have to have a thing, right? I'm interested in treatment. But there's a lot of work written about the being a generalist or being a specialist. What's the way to go? And the orthodoxy in science today is be a specialist. You've got to know, you've got to have a thing. Uh, I'd encourage you to read this book called Range on why generalists triumph in a specialized world. The thing about being a generalist is you have a wide angle lens. You have perspective. You have the ability to see things in context. If you only do one thing, you don't really know how it fits in a broader sphere of things. So I would absolutely encourage you to ha have some degree of flexibility in what you do. I don't know if you've heard of the concept of the hedgehog or the fox, um, but it's, there's, there's, a, there's a metaphor of hedgehogs and foxes, right? So the metaphor is that hedgehogs know one big thing and foxes know lots of little things. So a hedgehog is a person who spends their whole life doing one thing. This is their area. They've been banging on this one drum their whole lives. Foxes have lots of things that they jump around on. I'm a fox. I'm not a hedgehog. Uh, and one of the reasons why I have problems with people who are too hedgehoggy is that you have sunk emotional costs. If your whole career is predicated on one hypothesis, and go back to it, most of these things are wrong, you're going to end up in trouble because you end up being invested in one idea, and that idea may well not be going anywhere. So I would caution you to have breadth, to have, uh, to be open about it, because as they say, Prediction is hard, especially about the future. Most things are not going to succeed, and you have to be fleet of foot. I'll also say, because of that, I have never, ever been able to tell you in what I will be doing in five years' time. 
The project that I'm doing now, I would never have thought of that I'll be doing in five years' time because things are very, very unpredictable. The clues come from, I mean, I'm writing a grant now on chronic fatigue syndrome because work that we've done in bipolar disorder highlights a treatment that we think really might crack this condition. But it was not an interest of mine five years ago. And in five years' time, I hope I'll be doing something completely different because something has happened that t turns me in that idea. So you've always got to hold your ideas and your hypotheses with gossamer lightness because you have to be as critical of your own ideas, your own hypotheses, as your peers will be. That doesn't mean you mustn't pursue them. You have to pursue your ideas with passion but hold them with lightness. You have to be able to get rid of them. It's like being an investor. When your stocks are doing badly, you have to be able to sell them. But the problem is when you've only got one thing, it's really hard to sell because then you don't have anything left. I, let me finish off by saying that research is very nonlinear and stochastic. It never takes you where you think you're gonna do. And I'll give you mine the most nonlinear piece of research. So many moons ago, I was interested in, in anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. And this was when, when the SSRI antidepressants came along. And we were interested in developing an animal model of obsessive compulsive disorder. And we thought, eh, what animal behavior looks like obsessive compulsive disorder? And we thought, acrylic dermatitis in dogs. You know when these dogs lick, 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 lick? And we thought, we're gonna develop an animal model of OCD. So we thought, how do you prove it? Well, you do a clinical trial, give dogs placebo or fluoxetine, put it in a sausage, because if you put the pill inside a sausage, it'll disappear, <laughs> give it to the dogs, get vets to rate the photographs. Well, I don't have to tell you, we don't use this as a model of OCD, never took off, but it's now veterinary treatment. Uh, we had no intention of developing a veterinary treatment. We, had, we were not interested in animal behavior as a clinical problem, but that's where it ended up as a veterinary treatment. So research, is very nonlinear. You never know where you're gonna end up based on where you started, where you're starting from. And my journey has taken many zigs and many zags on the way. But you gotta still have a blue sky vision. You still have to have a big picture of what gets you out of bed in the morning. And the beauty of research at an existential level, I mean, in the end, life is finite, right? You wanna, and when, you, when we all shuffle off, it's not gonna be how much money you got and you know, how many holiday houses you got. It's gonna be what contribution you have made to the world. And research uniquely gives existential meaning. It allows you to say, I have contributed something to the greater benefit of mankind that I leave behind some kind of a legacy that is bigger than me. Uh, if we're successful. Most of us aren't gonna be successful, but we can at least give it a good, hot go. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes, great. Uh, questions from the room? Yeah, there's one just in the middle here. Um, thank you for that really insightful talk. Um, I just had a question regarding your inspirations in terms of, um, you sort of talked about jumping between different projects and sort of going when, where the wind took you sort of thing compared to sort of focusing on this one sort of long overarching project. Where do you find you drew, where do you draw inspiration, I guess is what I'm asking. Is it from clinical experiences? Is it from talking with colleagues? Could you just add some insight? All of the above. Right, so the inspiration from my idea for what we do uh, we follow the literature. You watch your patients. Your patients are your best teachers. They, they tell you what the problems are. Uh, they often give you clues to what the solutions are gonna be. So that goes back to where I started. Um, it really helps to be a clinician, to be a researcher. Um, you, you, talking to people of other disciplines, uh, and it, you don't know where, that, where it's gonna come from, but the more exposed you are to other things, other ideas, other ways of solving problems, the more likely you are to come up with something interesting. And often the work that you do, you, you know, we're narrowly focused on trying to solve one problem, but often you can, you're doing something, but it's got applicability way outside where you think it's gonna go. Uh, so you have to maintain some degree of fleetness of foot and flexibility. Thank you. 
Um, if, is there a, oh yeah, if we just bring the mic over here while it's heading that direction. I'll ask you this question from online, Michael, because it's a nice flip side of the one that was just asked. So, since many researchers fail, are there any factors that make research ideas work? Also, how do you stay motivated if your hard work doesn't come to fruition? Yeah, that's always the hard one. You know, um, it's you're running a marathon, you've done 30 kilometers, there's nothing left in the tank, your, your legs are aching, but you just want to get to the finishing line. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an analogy. You know, it's a tough journey, but you, you, you have to have, you know, grit really matters. Um, you, have to, you, you, you have to be able to defer gratification to a significant degree. If, you know, this is not a game for somebody who likes instant gratification. Um, and you have to be able to push through even though it's difficult. What's also really important is you have to disaggregate the success or failure of what you're doing from you as a human being in terms of your self-construct. This doesn't make you, a, your success doesn't make you a more worthwhile pa person and your failure does not make you a less worthwhile pa patient, person. You, 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 it's about the journey that you're going on. It's as long as you're doing what you do with passion and commitment, uh, and you have a, a sense of the big picture that you're heading towards, uh, that's, I think, is what ultimately is going to matter. Great. Thanks, Michael. Question just here. Uh, thank you for your, um, for your talk. I just had a particular question regarding your um, fox versus hedge star, I'm sorry, hedge star, hedgehog um, style approach to research. Um, how do you manage when you're when you're taking a fox like approach look into lots of different problems at uh, rather um, um, at unpredictable times and you come across say uh, something that piques your curiosity and you want to look closer into it how do you manage to secure the funding needed to look quickly into that particular in, into that particular problem if it did pique your curiosity given the uh, give, given the fact that these problems may not at first glance, look connected to one another. Wow, that is a complicated question. Well, there are many ways you can do this. The first thing is through partnerships. So when I'm looking into a new area, the first thing I do is I go and talk to who else is good in this area, who knows what they're talking about. Um, you, you also want to uh, look at what other resources are out there. Um, so collaborations and partnerships are, are key. Uh, at the same time, in, in research, particularly in clinical research, there are common research skills which will take you from one disease state into another. So if you're doing a clinical trial in one disease, it's not a huge leap to do a clinical trial in a, slightly diff in a, in a related disorder. And so a, a lot of this then comes up, uh, a lot of this is, you know, talking essentially about grant writing, I think you're talking about. because. Uh, then it's about how you, need, you weave an argument about the need, the capacity that you have, the idea that you've got, the partnerships that you've got, and that you've now gone on this journey which allows you to be in a position of, how you, of competitiveness to solve this question, especially if it's an unmet need, especially if it's your solution is novel or innovative, you're in the game. But uh, many organizations have some systems and capacities for seed funding uh, where, where you could get some degree of support from external sources within a, within a hospital, within a university to begin the, the catalytic process of taking this idea forward. But you've highlighted a, a really complex problem. Getting resources to take new ideas where you're new in the field, that's often very difficult. And sometimes you start by building up a track record, working under the, the wing of somebody who's got resources and capacity on a related project, and then you can move to independent research as you've developed a track record and a capacity of your own. But it's, a, it's, a not, a, it's not a simple journey, and there's no one recipe. Great, thanks. And just, oh yeah, uh, next door to you there. Uh, very good talk, thank you so much for that. Um, my question is about mentorship. As someone who wants to be a fox and not a hedgehog, I find myself surrounded by a lot of hedgehogs, and I'm uh, curious as to uh, what your experience is. When, when you're looking to be a fox, should you try and seek out a multitude of mentors that are hedgehogs, or a single mentor that is a fox, basically? Well, I think the mathematics is many hedgehogs make a fox. 
<laughs> and look, the thing about mentorship is that you'll get a great mentor for one issue or one area who might not be a great mentor in another issue or in another area. So I'd encourage you to get, have serial mentors in different areas around different issues. So some people might, uh, some people I know are fantastic at creative, out of the box, crazy ideas, but they're chaotic. And other people are brilliant at navigating organizational systems, um, but they have no, they've never had a, an original idea in their lives. And so it goes, right? And some people, you know, are great at whatever, and whatever your need is, you can find somebody who's good at uh, the area that you're struggling with, and you reach out. People are generally much more open than you might imagine, uh, and most senior people are much less scary than you might imagine. They really want to help. Um, the problem is, you know, it's knowing who's who, but it's unusual to reach out to somebody and they don't give you the time of day. And if they don't, well, you move on, right? There's, you've tried, you've knocked on the door, they're not there. Uh, but don't be shy to reach out. Uh, so my, my advice would be, your, pro your needs are gonna constantly change, and therefore the people that you have as mentors are likely to constantly change. You need, you, you're always gonna be learning different things from different people.